Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. This is Chris, and today what a spectacular opportunity is to talk to you about performance coaching for executives, and it's stage one. Stage one is all about willpower and discipline and getting what you want in life. The person uh, at the top of the mountain didn't fall there, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that there are many people in this world who want outcomes, who want more wealth, want more success, want more happiness, want more whatever it is, but aren't doing a lot to help themselves get it. So I want to talk today about why. So a master in the art of living uh, draws no sharp distinction between their work and their play, their labor and their leisure, their minds and their bodies, their education or their recreation. They hardly know which is which. They simply pursue their vision of excellence through whatever they're doing and leave others to determine whether they're working or playing. To themselves, it always seems that they're doing both. Now, he begins a dilemma. We've got our home life. We've got our work life. We've got uh, our spouse. We've got our friends. We've got our money. We've got, we've got competing objectives. And, and when we have those competing objectives, when we split off enjoyment from work, when we split off relationship from enjoyment and work from enjoyment and relationship, we've got competing forces. And when these competing forces come together, they make it really confusing to go to the top of the mountain. Let's have a look and go through that step by step together. Firstly, 1% of people actually act in a way that gets them to the top of their mountain. Now, that's a really, really sad statistic. 1% of people in the world are actually acting in a way that gets them to the top of their mountain. Why the heck would that be? Why do people not act in a way that gets them to the top of their own personal mountain? Why do people not walk the talk? Why do people do things that are not in alignment with the thing they say they want? This is such an important question because if you can answer this, you might be able to check in as to whether you're one of the 1% or whether you're one of the 99% who is actually self-sabotaging, who is actually spending their days and nights doing things that completely contradict what they are actually voc uh, vocalizing to say, I want something. So let's have a quick look. Reason number one, that people don't act in a way that gets them to the top of their mountain is they're not clear where their mountain is. In other words, they haven't written down a vision. They don't actually articulate and prioritize what's important. They say everything's important and I do want to go to the top of the mountain. I do want to have a million dollars in my bank account by the end of the year. I do want to have a baby. I do want to have a new house. I do want to have a new car. I do. They've got this stuff rattling around in their brain. But while it rattles around in their brain, that's no clarity. And clarity is really important in knowing where the top of the mountain is, obviously. And this trail, by the way, I can just do a little sideline. This trail, I've walked more than 400 times in my life. And you can see in the background, the mountain to the left, Way in the background is Mount Everest. Amma de Blum is the mountain over to the right. And Lotse is the mountain right directly down the middle of the camera. So this is about 10 kilometers from base camp. Uh, and it's just outside of Namchi Bazaar. Uh, you can, if you really look carefully on the image and look at the, at the, about the center of the, uh, about the center of the image, just a little bit to the right, you, you'll see a monastery there. That's called Tengbashe Monastery. And to get to that, you have to go down two kilometers from where this trail is into that black dark valley, back up the other side to get to Tengbashe on the way to Mount Everest Base Camp. So this is a short day's walk. It's about six hours of walking, but you drop down into a valley and drop up the other side to get to where you're going. Anyway, let's keep going as to why don't people uh, walk their talk? Why don't people act in a way that gets them to where they want to go? The second reason, they get lost. Now, the reason we get lost in life is we try to please people. We try to please our family. We try to please our parents. We try to please our partner. We try to please uh, uh, so many people. And suddenly we get, we, we might uh, slip off the rails and get disappointed, dis, uh, disillusioned. We might have an injury, a wound. We might uh, break a leg. We might break a brain. We might break a bank account. We might go broke. We might have a divorce. We might think, and suddenly we get lost. Do I really want to go up the top of this bloody mountain now? Do I really, really want what I wanted before? Do I want it now? And the answer is yes. And just because there's a speed bump in the road 
a stepping stone on the way to something doesn't mean you've screwed up or you should give up. Don't give up because a person who gives up is lost forever and they end up, uh, as you'll see later on in this little talk, they'll end up in a really, really, really tough place. The third reason is there's too many mountains at once. So you say, I want a healthy relationship. I want uh, to be a loving parent. I want to build a business success. I want a good company. I want, I want, I want. And you, you list down a whole lot of wants, which uh, don't appear to be at first, but they are actually in the end, very competing uh, objectives. For example, I want peace in my life and I want success in my life. Those two things are in competition with each other. Nobody who's searching for, for success in a competitive environment has what they call peace and tranquility. That person has activity, enthusiasm, engagement. So we sometimes look for antidotes to stress in, on the way to, getting, to doing something that requires a bit of stress. And when we look for the antidote and look for the stress, we start actually getting confused as to when I'm going right and when I'm going wrong. So too many mountains at once, too many goals, too many objectives, too many outcomes, and, and not prioritization. The fourth thing is the biggest one, the biggest reason. And do you know what that biggest reason is? Well, I'm going to talk about that in the rest of this video. We'll leave that for the next slide. Oh, and there's just one more thing. People give up. You know, this is one of the darkest, uh, saddest things, is people start working hard. And the day you start working hard to get your outcome is the day you fall prey to being one of the mass consciousness. You start reading self-help books, you start going on YouTube looking for cheap solutions, you start uh, searching around going to, to landmark seminars or, or Anthony Robbins or uh, Deepak Chopra or you st start uh, humming along with the Dalai Lama online. And when you join the mass consciousness, you've basically said, I give up. As an individual, I, I give up being an individual. I want to join a collective. Now, if we're talking about 1% of the world, you won't find them in a collective. Those 1% are individuals and they haven't given up being that they haven't given up their individuality because in your individuality is the key to your success. Let me continue. So I want to introduce the fourth reason why people uh, uh, don't walk their talk. They don't act in a way that they uh, um, uh, that will get them to the top of their mountain. And it's called Walker's Law of Lesser Pisses. I'll explain. Are you ready? You can please others and piss yourself off, or you can please yourself and piss others off, but you can't do both. So let me explain this. It's really important to take this on board. You can please others and piss yourself off, or you can please yourself and piss others off, but you can't do both. That's a really important understanding because sometimes we think in compliance or in making somebody happy, they will in return feed us back the equal amount we gave. So in other words, we, we, we get into the model and we do this when we're all the way up to our early uh, uh, mid-20s. We, we think that pleasing others will return itself in kind. But what you learn from the reality of life, which is way beyond these uh, gifts that they put on Instagram and what have you, what you learn is that if you give $100 to somebody and you value that $100 as a, 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 a really it's worth 100 bucks, to the person who's receiving it, they receive the 100 but they value it at around about 80 if they valued $100 at around about $100, they would already have the money you're giving them. So in other words, when you transfer a gift, when you give to others to please yourself, you give 100%, but they receive about 80% of what uh, you thought you were giving. And then in return, they give you back. And they give you back, not $80 because you gave currency, they give you back service or a product or a delivery. And they give you back what they consider to be 100%. But 
but they only got 80% of what you gave. So they, their 100% is actually 80% of what you measured. So they give you back their 100, which is now them giving you back 80% of what you gave. But in the process of giving it back to you, you receive it and you depreciate it by 20%. So by the time you give 100%, they receive it and then they give back their 100%, you get back 60% of what you gave. And that's why people get exhausted. They're trying to please people to get, ple to get pleased. This is a really big thing to get. So I think most people understand what I'm talking about here, especially people under the age of 30, because they've been taught right from the start, look after yourself. You can't give what you haven't got. But there is a problem. 99% of people, which is the, the group of people who are not in the 1% of the world's population, Get the word please wrong. When we said you can please yourself and piss others off, or you can please yourself and piss others off, what we're assuming here is that all of us, you, me, your friends, your family, your kids, your parents, everybody you know, understands the word please the same. But 99% of the world's population gets the word please wrong. Let me take you on a little story. Here's a picture of me, uh, another two days walk away from the earlier picture I showed you out of Bazaar on the way up to Mount Everest. And what you're looking at behind me here is the path up to Gokia Ri. And there are some magnificent mountains. And this is the valley that I love walking up because it's the not tourist path. You can see on my left, over my left shoulder, you can see the pathway. Well, you have to go down into that deep gully to go down and get back up to that pathway. And that pathway goes up to about 5,000 meters of walking. You can see an alternative track on, my, uh, on the right of my picture. That's a tiny little path and it's a very <laughs> precipitous pathway and I don't like walking on it because it's a very deep drop from it. So I'd rather err towards fun than, than uh, risk. But that's just my way of going to places. And I'm in a little village here called Fortse, P-H-O-R-T-S-E, and I love that village very much. So on the way up a Himalayan mountain, people have the word please. I will be pleased when I get to uh, the base camp. I will be pleased when I get home from this trek. I will be pleased when I don't have a blister. So the word pleased starts to weave itself throughout the whole experience of going on a long walk up a Himalayan mountain to get to a base camp. Now, there's no life and death threats here, so we're not often saying, I'll be pleased when I'm out of danger. We're mostly saying, I'll be pleased when I get comfortable. The shorter the time frame of the word please becomes, the less motivated an individual becomes. So if, if somebody says to me, I have a blister in my foot, I really want that blister, I, I want that blister to go away because I have no pleasure in this trip with a blister in my foot. Their definition of please is very, very immediate. And my job is to fix their immediate problem. That's called management, self-management. So when we say the law of lesser pisses, to piss, please yourself and piss others off or please others and piss yourself off, if we start to talk about instantaneous gratification, like fixing a blister, like earning a bit more money, like buying a car when we can't afford it, like buying a, a, or eating an ice cream when it's going to put on weight, we start to talk very immediate gratification. And the second we start to talk about instantaneous gratification, pleasure right now, this moment, I'm pleased, I'm having a glass of expensive wine, I'm pleased, we start to talk about the model of reward. And when we reward ourselves, oh, I'm so tired, I'm going to reward myself with a, I don't know, ice cream. I'm going to reward myself with a little indulgence. And when the word please shrinks in time, we become very dangerous. We become very dangerous to ourselves because we start to lose discipline. When we lose discipline, in other words, what will get me what I want in life, in other words, to the top of the mountain, when we lose discipline, it's not because we're not strong. It's not because we're not powerful people. It's because we've defined the word please 
in a very, very immediate sense. I'm going to please myself now because I might not be alive tomorrow. I'm going to please myself now because maybe I won't have a job tomorrow. I'm going to please myself now because maybe my partner won't love me tomorrow. I'm going to please myself now because maybe it won't come in the future. I'll take whatever I can get. And we then start to compromise. And as soon as we narrow down the word please to the next few seconds, the next few minutes, the next few hours, the next week, the next few days, we lose discipline. The second we lose discipline, we end up with all sorts of problems. We end up with problems like this. We end up with heart problems. We end up with obesity. And we end up spending money we haven't got to get short-term gratification for what really deserves to be a long-term outcome. We start to spend today what we needed to be spending in the future. We start to try to get pleasure from the future in the present moment right now. It leads to a quote, the pain of regret always outweighs the pain of discipline. Now, we don't know the pain of regret because it's not here right now. And so we say, well, to hell with the discipline, to hell with the things that I need to do to walk my talk, to keep me going to the top of my mountain, to hell with that. Why would I sacrifice pleasure right now to get something that I don't know I'll regret in the future. But here's what's going to be really important. What I'm going to say is, and this can only be gauged by going out and looking at nature. Look at anything in nature that sought short-term gratification. Anything, any animal, any a tree, anything that has acted in a way that is that is it that has valued the immediate in lieu of the long term. And you'll see a dead tree, a dead bird, a dead dog, a dead animal, a dead person. You'll see somebody who's valued the short term in lieu of the long term. And that leads me to say, if you want to prove whether I'm right or wrong, go to an old people's home. Go to a hospital and go to someone who's got a back pain. Go to someone who didn't stretch. Go to someone who has valued the short term gratification of doing something more than the long-term consequences of doing it right. They will have regret. And we look back, and if you go to an old people's home or a hospital or, or a place where people have not followed their true inspiration to the top of their mountain, you will meet the 99% of people who look back in the past and regret it. The pain of discipline, the pain of discipline is far less than the pain of regret. It's far less. So why? Why do we do that? Why would we know this fact of life, the discipline and the cost of it, far, far, far cheaper than regret? Well, the answer is this. We don't have a vision that's compelling enough. We have rhetoric. We have statements on a piece of paper. We have thoughts in our head. Oh, I'd like to be wealthy. Or, oh, I'd like to be happy. Oh, I'd like to build a really nice house on the... Oh, but when someone says, get up in the morning at 4 a.m., synchronize your subconscious brain with your conscious brain, affirm, visualize. When someone says, get some exercise every two hours. When someone says, walk in nature every day. When someone says, balance your mind. When someone says, do your exercise and, and follow your dreams. Do the practice and all is coming. Do the practice and all is coming. What is the practice? The practice is discipline in the now in order to avoid the pain of regret in the future and the pain of regret is not hitting our target. So in order to avoid sabotaging our dreams, our visions, our hopes, our aspirations in the future, we must apply discipline now. We must set up a routine. And to do that and have that routine as really, really important to us and have the application and the, and the determination to stick to it and be, one, be in the 1% of the world population, we need a compelling vision. And that, my friends, is no joke. Have a beautiful day. Bye for now.